Hey, Gateway, thank you all for joining us online to worship this morning. Uh, let us know in the comments below just where you're watching from, whether it's at home or just anywhere you're at. Uh, if you're missing out on a personal connection, uh, we have multiple ways for y'all to stay connected. Feel free to join a Zoom small group. Uh, we have Gateway Midweeks, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Or just uh, help partner with us as a church because there's so many opportunities to help uh, just stay connected with the community and there's just so much that, uh, that we can do. Uh, with Gateway Anywhere, you can watch our services online or in person. So we have services at 8.30 and 10.30 for, for adults. And then we also have a 9.45 uh, kids service. And then uh, you could join us in person Sunday at 9 a.m. Yes, and we're doing a lot of events here now at Gateway. On October 16th, we're doing our family Hawaiian bingo night. If you have a family, you've got kids, bring your parents, bring whoever. We're going to be playing bingo. You can dress up in a Hawaiian theme. We've got prizes to give out. Come join us and make some memories with your family during this time. Uh, if you're going to be coming, please let us know. You can RSVP to this event at gatewayvisalia.com. And Gateway, thank you guys so much for your continued faithfulness. Uh, let us know you're here by filling out an online connection card by going to the Gateway webpage. And uh, there's multiple ways to tithe. You can tithe uh, online, uh, you can mail it in, or come in person through our offices uh, every Tuesday and Thursday morning. So this is our opportunity to learn from God's word and to worship him as a church family. Let's get into the mode. Let's get into uh, just this time of worship. Let's do it, church.
Good morning and welcome to Gateway Online. I'm Guy. Hi, Guy. This morning we're going to worship our holy God. Our God is holy. Would you join with us this morning? You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. Sing that again. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will follow. I will listen.
in him tempted tried and sometimes failing he my strength my victory wins You're rich. You're rich. 
Jesus' name, amen. Hello, church. We're in our series in the book of First Peter. And uh, we've entitled this Hope in Troubled Times. And so today we're talking about hope. We're talking about hope and hopelessness. Uh, in 1953, uh, Martin Seligman was 11 years old and he played Little League for the Lake Luzerne Dodgers in the state of New York. And there were two very gifted athletes on Martin's baseball team, uh, Danny and Teddy. And Danny could stretch out horizontal three feet above the ground and catch the uh, beeline drive that was ripping down towards third base and Teddy could slide underneath the tag at home plate and they were the two most gifted uh, athletes on the Luzerne, uh, the Lake Luzerne Dodgers. But in 1953, uh, other than the atomic bomb, uh, polio was the most feared 
uh, disease in the world. And the call finally came that both Danny and Teddy had contracted polio and the entire Little League season uh, was abandoned and parents kept their children at home lest the polio spread and the infection spread and more children contracted it. Uh, Danny ended up with a nerve-damaged right arm and right leg, and his baseball career came to an end, and Teddy actually uh, died. Uh, Martin Seligman, uh, the next year, got the Salk polio vaccine, and Little League was played again in 1954, and the epidemic was over, and uh, Martin Seligman says, I never knew anyone else who contracted polio uh, after that, and that vaccine went worldwide and the eradication of, t of polio was almost completed. Uh, Seligman graduated from high school, went to the University of Pennsylvania because he had been influenced by a psychiatrist there by the name of Aaron T. Beck. And uh, Dr. Beck was called the father of cognitive therapy. Uh, what's cognitive therapy? Well, cognitive therapy says this. Uh, if I change the way you think, I can change the way you feel, and I can change the consequences of your life. Uh, changing the way you feel is difficult. You have to change the way you think, and then your consequences will be changed uh, down the road. And Dr. Seligman was very influenced by that. He decided to become a psychiatrist himself. He ended up being a professor at the University of Pennsylvania alongside Dr. Beck, and he did some interesting, kind of sick and twisted studies. He decided, it's a very famous study, he decided that he was going to find out uh, why depression had such a huge influence and hopelessness had such a huge influence on people. So he did a study where he took uh, a room and he made part of it, uh, part of the floor electrified and the other part was not, and they would put a dog on the electrified side and they would shock the dog thinking that what the dog would do was run to the other side of the room and find out if it was any better over there. And to their great surprise, the dogs just sat down and endured shock after shock after shock. And they uh, titled that response, Learned Helplessness, and they extrapolated it out to people. And they said, oftentimes when Peter, people encounter adversity early in their lives and they don't learn some kind of strategy to overcome that adversity, uh, they fall victim to what's called learned helplessness or hopelessness uh, in their lives. And so... Uh, they realized that they had to intervene in the dog's life and teach them when they got shocked to run to the other side of the room. Uh, they intervened, they did that, and all of a sudden they realized they had a group of dogs with learned helplessness who were very depressed and a group of dogs that overcame their helplessness and were very optimistic dogs. And so uh, they divided those dogs into two groups and they did another sick and twisted uh, study where they implanted cancerous tumors in both groups and they found that the optimistic dog's immune system was elevated because of the optimism and they overcame their cancer at a much higher rate than the dogs who felt helpless and hopeless. Well, Dr. Seligman did his studies and became somewhat famous, and the day came where he finally got to meet uh, Dr. Jonas Salk, who had invented the vaccine uh, for polio that Seligman had received as a 12-year-old boy that allowed him to continue in Little League, and he sat down and he talked to Dr. Salk at a conference, and Dr. Salk said this to him, if I were a young scientist like you today, I would still do immunization studies. But instead of immunizing kids physically for polio, I'd do it your way. I'd immunize them psychologically against learned helplessness. I'd see if the psychologically immunized kids could then fight off mental illness and physical illness uh, better and in a uh, longer term way. And so Seligman ended up writing a book of cognitive therapy about his learned helplessness and he called it The Optimistic Child. And in that book, he, uh, I quote, 
We want our children to have lives filled with friendship and love and high deeds. We want them to be eager to learn and be willing to confront challenges. We want our children to be grateful for what they received from us, but to be proud of their own accomplishments as well. We want them to grow up with confidence in the future, a love of adventure, a sense of justice, courage enough to act on that sense of justice. We want them to be resilient in the face of setbacks and failures that growing up always brings. And when the time comes, we want them to be good parents. And so it's a great book, The Optimistic Child by Dr. Martin uh, Seligman. And so Seligman's approach in this book to learned helplessness is the ABC model of cognitive therapy. A stands for adversity, when we face an adversity in life, and B is belief. What we believe we can do against that adversity uh, creates C, which is consequences. And so if you want to change the way you, the consequences of your life come, you have to change your belief and your interpretations about adversity. And the Apostle Peter tells us exactly that in 1 Peter as we look through our passage today because Peter addresses this idea of suffering and yet having hope through that suffering so the consequences of our life serve Christ and his kingdom in a much greater way. And, and so hope is an optimistic outlook, not based on our own ability as human beings, but based on the victory of Jesus Christ, very different than Seligman's approach. And so Peter says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Well, what are we supposed to do? How do we approach and interpret the, the suffering in life? How do we deal with it? Well, Peter tells us exa exactly that, what we are to believe. And he says this, sanctify, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an answer or an account for the hope that is in you, yet your attitude should be gentleness and reverence. Well, what does the word sanctify mean? How do we do that? How do we sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts? Well, the word sanctify means to set apart. Uh, that does not mean set aside. It doesn't mean that. To set apart it means to treat like royalty. Uh, elevate Christ, set him apart and up on the throne of heaven, set him apart uh, like royalty, because you are going to make him Lord in your hearts. And the word Lord comes from the Greek word kurios, which means supreme authority. Sanctify Christ as a supreme authority in your heart. And so two reasons that you need to do that, because if Christ is royalty, your heart can trust in him. Uh, the reason the translators of the King James Bible chose that word Lord for this word kurios, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, was because the most powerful person in England at the time that had direct contact with the people was the Lord of the castle in the 1600s. And so the Lord of the castle, uh, when the invader Vikings came to destroy everything, all of the serfs that farmed the land would run to the Lord and run to the castle for protection and for safety. And so when the translators of the King James Bible came to this word supreme authority for Kyrios, they said, that's the Lord because he has direct impact in the lives of his people. And so uh, they, they translated this, set apart Christ as royalty in your hearts as the supreme authority because you can run to him for protection and for safety. The second reason we treat Christ like royalty, is if Christ is royalty, your future is in his hands. Your future is in his hands, and we are in the hands of Christ, and we are in good hands. And so uh, Peter writes, now once you've done that, you've now begun to interpret suffering differently. The adversity, A, is suffering. The B is belief. You believe that Christ is Lord and the supreme authority in your life. So he's going to change the way you think. And therefore, the consequences of what happens in your life are going to be different. So Peter says, keep a good conscience. So that in the thing in which, they, uh, in which you are slandered, 
Those who revile your what? Your good behavior. Even though suffering, you believe Christ is Lord and he brought this into your life, then you're going to do good things through that suffering. Even those who revile your good behavior in Christ uh, will be put to shame. You know, we look across the world and there are just uh, people that do not have good behavior. Uh, in the past, there has been this group called the uh, Westboro Baptist Church, and they have shown up to protest at the graveside and the cemeteries of uh, people who have lost their life uh, in some kind of American war. The Iraq War, Dana Bean had a son, Matthew, who died in Iraq. And they showed up at her son's funeral service to protest, and they interrupted it. And here's what Dana Bean said. I agree with their freedom of speech, but they're twisted. They're twisted. Sometimes Christians take the wrong approach. Uh, sometimes Christians take the wrong approach to adversity. Uh, we are, when we face suffering, when we face adversity, we are to believe that Jesus is the supreme Lord of our lives, and we are to install him on that throne, and then our good behavior is to resonate uh, throughout our community. And, and so then Peter writes, for it is better if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. Don't suffer for doing what's wrong. You're just getting the just desserts of your behavior. Suffer for doing what is right. Uh, for Christ also died for sins. He suffered for doing what was right because he died once for all. He is just and he died for the unjust so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh for doing what was right. Christ did what was right but he was made alive in the spirit. And so uh, as he died on the cross and was buried, he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who were once disobedient. What in the world does that mean? It means that Christ descended to what is called uh, Abraham's bosom, to the place where the souls of people who have died previously were kept, and he proclaimed victory over the grave, and he made a proclamation, you know, just like people would show up in merry old England, hear ye, hear ye. And so Jesus went to uh, Abraham's bosom um, and proclaimed victory over death. And so it says that he did that during that time of burial. But when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. What, why, how in the world does he switch all the way from Jesus' death to the days of Noah? Because he wants to make sure that we know what a righteous person looks like who's not per perfect like Jesus. And so in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. Well, what has Noah got to do with this? Well, Peter, again, is a Jewish person. He's an Old Testament person. And he brings out Noah because what was Noah's instruction? Noah, I want you to tell the people they're lost. I want you to tell the people that they've stopped trusting in the authority and the lordship and the sovereign throne of God in heaven. And I want, Noah, I want you to tell them to repent. And Noah preached for over 100 years, 120 years, not one person ever raised their hand. Not one person ever repented. Not one person said, Noah, I'm going to believe in the God you serve. Let me help you build that boat because I want to reserve my passage on your ship. Not one person did that. Uh, you know, how discouraged did Noah get? He kept building the ark because he trusted that God's word was true. And the people that Jesus visited found out God's word is true, that the Messiah came and died on the cross and was going to take all of those who had placed their faith and trust uh, in the Messiah uh, to heaven to be with God forever. And, and so Peter uses this illustration of Noah to say, don't get discouraged about suffering. Maybe God is going to do something entirely new. Uh, maybe everyone that, that you know, is, is bringing suffering into your life is just going to be taken away. Uh, maybe God will do something different, uh, but make sure you trust in Christ through your suffering because you serve a purpose. Noah served a purpose in his life, even though no one believed. And so Peter says, you know, just like Noah, corresponding to that, 
Similar to that, baptism now saves you, not the act of baptism, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but the symbolic impact of baptism, which is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. So when I'm baptized, I'm saying I am identifying with Jesus. Uh, I want to be uh, buried and I want to be raised in newness of life. Just as Jesus died, was buried, and was raised, symbolically in baptism, I'm saying I'm trusting in that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I am putting my faith and trust in the death, burial, and res- in the resurrection of Jesus because he went to Abraham's bosom, proclaimed victory. I'm believing in his victory, not in my own goodness, because I'm being baptized in his name. I'm believing in his goodness and his perfection and his substitutionary death on the cross, the just, Jesus was just, and he died for the unjust. And he was my substitute, and I accept his substitutionary payment for my sin. And so corresponding to that, I get baptized as a physical demonstration to my church family that, hey, I've put my trust in Jesus in the same way. And after the resurrection of Christ, he went to the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been what put in submission to him. Everything has been made subject to the authority, to the supreme authority of Christ on the throne in heaven, and we are all his subjects. We are his serfs And we run to the Lord. We sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. And when we suffer, we believe that Jesus paid for all sin. And that no matter what happens in this life, uh, I will be with him in heaven forever. So that's our Bible study. Peter, sometimes Peter's a little hard to follow because he's kind of all over the place a little bit in his thinking. His writing is very different than Paul's and very different than John's. Very different than Matthew's. and, And he writes... He writes in a, in, a, in a style that maybe sometimes it's a little hard to follow uh, where he's going logically. And you have to really think. You have to really think about what Peter's trying to say. And he's just trying to tell us the same thing Seligman was telling us in his psychology studies. Is that when we hit adversity, suffering, we need to trust Christ. We need to believe and interpret our suffering through the throne of Christ. And it will change uh, the consequences of how we behave. Uh, we, may, we'll, we will have a new definition for suffering that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this my best behavior so that people can see Jesus in me. So that brings us to the end of our Bible study. So we need to ask our most important question. Are you ready? Take a deep breath. Here we go. One, two, three. So what? <laughs> what difference does any of this stuff make in my life? Well, I'm going to give you four ways to replace hopelessness with victory through Jesus Christ. Uh, We need to realize we have the victory of a blessed future. That's the consequence. We're going to go in reverse order here. That's the consequence. We want a blessed future. And, And Peter tells us, if you live for Jesus, when you go to work, maybe it's difficult. But if you live for Jesus, there's a consequence out there called a blessed future. Uh, God is going to bless you. He is going to uh, give you a reward for every single thing you do when you face adversity with your trust in Christ because you have sanctified him as Lord in your heart and you're going to follow him and you're going to obey him. Secondly, the victory of choice. Uh, You get to sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. That's your belief. Jesus is the supreme authority in my heart. So even though my heart wants success, my heart wants ease, my heart wants peace and personal enjoyment, my heart, you know, wants wants the easy street of life. But when Jesus is on the throne of my life, I believe that he is guiding me and leading me through life. And so I face whatever the adversity is with a belief, with an interpretation of life, that God is in the middle of this. And third, it's the victory of spiritual preparation. Always be ready with an answer. Always be ready with an answer. Why can you smile and have a good attitude and, and, and keep working for that, for that boss you have that's unfair and ridicules you? How can you keep going with such a great attitude? Well, 
You know, I believe that God guides and leads me. I've put Christ on the throne of my life, and whatever I face, he is with me, he knows about it, and I'm just going to do the best I can. I'm going to be the best employee, I'm going to be the best worker, I'm going to be the best administrator, I'm going to be the best teacher, I'm going to be the best, whatever it is, I'm going to be the best I can be because Christ is on the throne of my life and I have sanctified him, set him apart as the supreme authority uh, in my life. And so I give that kind of an answer. People, people are the best advertisement of any kind of a product. Uh, a few years ago, I was wearing contact lenses. I got I got tired of these glasses, and I got some contact lenses, and they were, they were the hard contact lenses, and boy, it took my eyes forever to get used to those things, and finally, I got rid of them, and I got disposable contact lenses. Oh, my gosh, night and day. It was like, it was like you know, sleeping on concrete versus sleeping on a feather-down mattress. I mean, it was just night and day, these contacts. I love these contacts. And, and, I, and I saw a friend of mine, Gil Stiglitz. He's preached here before a couple of times. And I saw Gil, and he had just gotten these contacts, and his eyes were red. And he was telling me, yeah, I'm getting used to these contacts. I don't like I said, let me tell you about my contact lenses. Oh, my gosh, I got the soft a permeable, disposable contacts. They're the greatest contacts in the world. And I kind of went a little overboard. <laughs> and about a month later, I saw him again. And he goes, go ahead, give me the spiel about the contact lenses again. You know, because I, had, I, I, I was so excited about my new contacts. The best answer, the best testimony, the best advertisement of a product is a satisfied customer. You know, and when Christ is on the throne of my life, I can... I can interpret my circumstances in an entirely different way, and I can be a satisfied customer of God, and I can just talk to people about the great things that God is doing in my life. But I have to prep myself with putting Christ as the supreme authority on the throne of my heart. And then fourthly, uh, the victory of a godly example, and this is the idea of adversity in the days of Noah. Noah faced adversity. Noah faced people mocking him, demeaning him, ridiculing him, laughing in his face. And yet, he continued on through that, and he constructed the ark, and he did what God asked him to do. You know, sometimes you read stories that are just great stories of what uh, faith in Christ is all about. There was a, there was a, a couple uh, that were in uh, North Dakota, Crosby, near Crosby, North Dakota, a man by the name of Lane. And Lane uh, was out driving his uh, combine one day to harvest his crops, and it caught fire, and uh, he grabbed the fire extinguisher and was running around trying to put it out. And because of all the physical exertion, Lane had a heart attack and was taken off to uh, the hospital. And this story appeared in USA Today newspaper uh, back in September, and uh, 60 local farmers came together with 11 combines, 11 semi-trucks with trailers, and several grain carts with tractors. And in seven hours, they harvested 15,000 bushel, bushels of canola, 35,000 uh, bushels of durum across 1,000 acres of farmland, and their wives made a month's, a month's worth of meals and filled a freezer for Lane's family. And a friend explained to the newspaper reporter when they interviewed him, the outpouring of support for Lane and his family is not surprising for those of us who live here. We have a long history of helping people in our community when they are faced with tragedy or hardship. We strongly believe in family, faith, and the golden rule of Jesus, do unto others as you would have him do unto you. And you know, when you hear a story like that, you know, isn't there something in your soul that says, I want to live in that kind of community. I want to live with those kind of people. See, and, and the issue is, you can. You can. And you create that kind of a community every day when you sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts and you give answers to people, even during suffering, the greatest advertisement for Christ is even during suffering, I am going to have hope and I'm going to believe that Jesus is on the throne and that one day 
uh, I will see the victory of my faith in heaven because I will be with him because he loves me and guides me and helps me as I face uh, the obstacles daily in my life. I hope uh, you do that every day. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful today for your word, for the words of the Apostle Peter who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and learned from Jesus and was discipled by Jesus and then went out into the world and did the same for hundreds of other people. Father, we thank you for his life and for his testimony to us through his little letter of 1 Peter. And Father, we ask that you would help us to have uh, that victory mentally every day. Even when we face adversity, we believe and we interpret that you are at work in our lives and therefore the consequence of what happens is, is victory over our circumstances. And you know, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you're here today and you have never sanctified Christ as Lord in your heart, you have never put your faith and trust in him, we invite you to do that today. In fact, I'm going to say a little prayer out loud, and you can pray this prayer silently, and you can say, Dear Father, thank you that Jesus Christ died on a cross and paid for all of my sin. I put my total trust and faith in him for eternal life. And I will make Christ the supreme authority in my life so that even if I face suffering, I'll know that he's at work in me. In Jesus' name. Father, we're grateful for your love for us, for the grace that you've extended to us by sending your son to be our substitutionary um, sacrifice on the cross so that we might be able to experience a new life and eternal life through faith. We ask that you would just continue to build and grow and expand and broaden our faith every day in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great week. Well, hey, if you accepted Christ today, please let us know by just marking it on your online connection card. We just love to celebrate with y'all and just walk alongside y'all as you begin this journey of just your faith in Christ. Uh, just as a reminder, you can uh, tithe through our app online on our webpage, or by mailing your gift to the church. Thank you for joining us online today. Just know that we as a church staff are praying for each and every one of you as Gateway is here to invite others in, connect through relationship, and develop our gifts to serve our community. We'll see you next week, church.